Hi again, I want to talk to you today about being unequally yoked. There are many ways of looking at the idea of being unequally yoked, but the Bible is very clear about how it should be applied as far as being in a biblical sense, what being unequally yoked is. And we're going to look at some of the various situations that apply to being unequally yoked. So the whole idea of being unequally yoked in the Bible is basically shown in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and starting at verse 14. It says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now the best way to look at the word yoked here is to think about oxen. That's what was in mind when this was written, because oxen were yoked together. And if you were plowing a field and you had oxen that were unequally yoked, you couldn't plow your field effectively. So if you had two oxes that worked together well, you'd want to keep those two oxes yoked together and they would work together well. So be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers would be talking about trying to accomplish something, being yoked together. That would be some kind of a relationship where you're trying to accomplish something because oxen when they're yoked together they're yoked together for a reason to plow a field so being unequally yoked together would cause problems in trying to accomplish the goal at hand so be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers is telling us that unbelievers and believers should not be yoked together that's unequal there's an unequal yoking with believers and unbelievers and the reason for that is told us as it as the verse continues be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness it says in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 in the previous chapter right before it says this about it being unequally yoked it says in chapter 5 verse 21 for he hath made him to be sin for us god made jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Christians are made the righteousness of God in him. We don't earn this righteousness. We are made the righteousness of God in him. By being in Christ, we are made righteous. So it's important to look at the context here. We are made righteous by being in Christ Jesus. This is stated in numerous places in the Bible, but Romans chapter 3 is another place that mentions it. Verse 21 but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. The law is about earning things. You have to obey laws in order to earn something or to, in order to not be punished. That's earning is obeying laws. The righteousness of God is without the law. The righteousness of God is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there's no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So here we see that everyone's in the same boat everyone has come short of the glory of God and the righteousness of God is by faith in Jesus Christ upon all that believe and as we saw in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 God has made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin now that's substitutionary that means that our sins no longer exist because they were put on Jesus he was made to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made we're made the righteousness of God. We don't earn the righteousness of God. We are made the righteousness of God in him. So a believer has righteousness that was given to him by God. So when we read in the next chapter about being unequally yoked, it says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? So it's telling us that basically we have a righteousness that was given to us. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. That righteousness was given to us. We did not earn it. So that righteousness sets us apart. We are made holy, so to speak. Holiness is set apart. Being holy is being set apart. That's what holiness is, is being set apart. We were set apart by being given this righteousness without any works of our own. We are made holy. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. God made him to be sin for us. It was done for us. What fellowship has righteousness? That would be believers. We have righteousness that was given to us as a gift. What fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? So the righteousness we have is a gift, and that means the unrighteousness 
is associated with unbelievers because they have not received the free gift of righteousness that belongs to believers. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. The righteousness of God is for all who believe. So unbelievers are those who don't believe. And they are considered unrighteous in God's sight. Why? Because they don't believe. They're unbelievers. Those who believe are given righteousness as a gift. So be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's telling you that a believer has righteousness that's given to him. And working, being yoked together, working together with an unbeliever is an unequal yoking. So a common interpretation of this would be going into business with someone who's not a believer. If you're a Christian and you have the righteousness of God, you're going to have the kingdom of God at heart. You're going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. If you're an unbeliever, you don't have that mindset. The kingdom of God is not at the forefront of your thoughts. An unbeliever will have worldly goals and objectives. So they will be unequally yoked together with a believer because a believer is seeking first the kingdom of God. He's not looking for riches on this earth. He's looking to store up riches in heaven. And those riches are not gained by worldly means. So unbelievers are going to have worldly means in mind for accomplishing worldly objectives. So being unequally yoked together with unbelievers would include being in business with someone who's not a believer. If you're trying to go into business with someone who's an unbeliever, you're going to be unequally yoked because you should have the kingdom of God at heart. You should be seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. An unbeliever is not going to be doing that. So if you're working together with someone, you're yoked together with someone with a different objective, well, if the objective is to plow a field, and the unbeliever doesn't want to plow the field, and the believer does, well, you're unequally yoked. Those oxen are going to be working against each other. They're not equally yoked. They won't be working together. So the idea of being yoked and unequally yoked has a lot to do with what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness. Because the unrighteousness that is attributed to unbelievers is not because they're any better or worse persons. It's because they don't have the gift of righteousness given to them. The gift of righteousness we have, we have in us the Zoe, the life of God that makes us want to do the right thing when we're born again. When you're born again, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, created after God in true righteousness and holiness. Remember Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. Put on the new man, and it's talking about your mind, being renewed in the spirit of your mind, the attitude of your mind, and put on the new man, which is already in your spirit. In your spirit, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, but your mind is the same mind you had as before you were saved. So he's talking to believers here, and he says, be renewed in the attitude of your mind and put on the new man that's already in your spirit, man. You already are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now put that on in your mind, because in your spirit, you're a new creation. Man is spirit, soul, and body. And your spirit is your new creation, but your mind has to be renewed. And you have to put on that new man. Now that new man that's already in your spirit, that man is created in righteousness and true holiness. The new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So that righteousness and holiness is in you when you're born again and you desire to do what's right. Romans chapter 7 and verse 22 Paul says, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. In other words, in the inward man, I delight after the law of God. The law of God is to love one another, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and love one another. That's the laws of God in the New Testament. But I see another law at work in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, unbelievers, they don't have the righteousness of God in their spirit. So this war is a one-sided war. Their members are going to win out. A Christian man is created in true righteousness and holiness because he's a new creation in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, right before it talks about being unequally yoked, it says in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He's not going to be a new creation. He's not becoming a new creation. He is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And of course, that is in your spirit, man, that he's talking about. So you're a new creation. You have the righteousness of God and you want to do what's right. So in the next chapter, in chapter 6, where he's talking about being not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, and he says, what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness, Paul's basically saying that a Christian has different objectives, different ideas, and different 
motivations than an unbeliever. An unbeliever doesn't have the righteousness of God. What fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? If you haven't received the free gift of righteousness, like an unbeliever hasn't, then you're in your natural state, which is darkness. What communion has light with darkness? So notice that a believer is called righteousness. An unbeliever is called unrighteousness. A believer is called light. An unbeliever is called darkness. Now that doesn't mean the unbeliever is any worse at anything that they do. It doesn't mean that they're not effective at what they do. It means that they don't have the righteousness of God because they haven't believed in Jesus. Unbelievers, they haven't believed in Jesus Christ. It's the only thing they haven't done. Anything else they've done or haven't done is beside the point. You shouldn't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers because not because they're better or worse at anything, not because they're good at something or bad at something, but because they're not believers. They don't have the righteousness of God in them, so their whole outlook is going to be different than a believer's outlook. And then verse 16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. So here we see that believers are the temple of the living God and unbelievers are called idols. The, the comparison is the temple of God being a Christian and idols being unbelievers. Now that's because they haven't received the free gift of righteousness. Talking about believers here, it says, for you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So here we see the difference here. God, he dwells in us and walks in us. He is our God. That's the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. And that's enough to make it an unequal yoking if you're working with someone who's an unbeliever. So this concept here of being unequally yoked together with unbelievers is talking about being yoked. It's talking about being in a relationship with an unbeliever, a business relationship, or even a marriage relationship. If you're yoked together with someone, you have a relationship where you're working together with that person. That would include a business relationship, a marriage. But he's not telling us to have nothing to do with unbelievers. He's saying, don't be yoked together with them. In other words, don't go into business with them or be in a covenant relationship with them. Verse 17 says, wherefore come out from among them, talking to believers, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. So here we see what he's talking about. He's saying, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And he's saying, come out from among them. In other words, don't be among them in your relationships, your business relationship. Yoke together. Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Come out from those yokings. Don't be yoked with them. Come out from among them and be separate. God told us we're ambassadors to the world. It says in verse 20, now then we Christians are ambassadors for Christ. Well, who are we ambassadors to? Verse 7, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation, the word or message of reconciliation. So the message of reconciliation is given to believers. And who, who are we ambassadors to? The world. God was reconciling the world to himself. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ to the world. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Now that's obviously talking to unbelievers because unbelievers are not reconciled to God. They need to be reconciled to God. And he's given us the ministry of reconciliation or the word of reconciliation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. You have become a new creation in Christ Jesus in your spirit when you're born again. So our ambassadorship is to the world. Because who did God reconcile to himself? God reconciled the world to himself. And we are ambassadors for Christ. So you're not supposed to separate yourself from the world entirely. You're supposed to separate yourself from relationships with the world. In other words, you're going to come in contact with people in the world. And you should come in contact with people in the world. You are an ambassador for Christ. We, believers, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Did you ever see an ambassador for another country, come into a country and then never talk to the people of that country? That's not an ambassador, is it? An ambassador is someone who communicates with the people of another country. Ambassadors to the UN, they represent their nations and they present the case of that nation. 
and they they communicate with the other nations well we're ambassadors for christ to the world that means we're supposed to communicate with the world you're not supposed to separate yourself completely from the world you're supposed to separate yourself from relationships that's why it says in chapter six wherefore come out from among them and be separate and touch down any unclean thing and i will receive you so you're not supposed to touch the unclean things of the world that doesn't mean you shouldn't come in contact with the people of the world. You should not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Don't be unequally yoked with them. Be in a business relationship or be in a yoked relationship together with unbelievers. You're not working with them, in other words. You're working with other believers. That's what your job is as an ambassador. You're part of the body of Christ. Unbelievers are not, and that's why we want them to get saved. Because remember, First Timothy Chapter 2, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he's long, long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So that tells you God wants everyone to be saved. And that's why 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is so important when it tells us we're Christ's ambassadors. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. In other words, he just wants them to believe in him so he can make them new creations in Christ Jesus. When you're born again, you're made a new creation in Christ Jesus. You don't earn the righteousness of God. No, see, God's not imputing their trespasses against them. He wants them to receive Jesus Christ so they can have the righteousness of God. So we're the ambassadors for Christ. We're ambassadors to the world. We need to communicate with the world. You need to have communication with people in the world. So chapter 6 is not talking about separating yourself completely from the world. It says, come out from among them and be separate and touch not the unclean things. Of the world. In other words, don't be in a yoked relationship. Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Now, this applies especially in marriage. In marriage, it's, gonna, it's very difficult for a believer to be married to an unbeliever because, once again, you have different goals. If you have the kingdom of God first in your mind and your spouse doesn't, well, what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? One of those people in that relationship is righteous and the other is unrighteous not because of anything they did not because they're better or worse people but because the righteousness of God is given to everyone who believes if you believe if you're not an unbeliever if you believe in Jesus Christ then you have the righteousness of God as a gift and you shouldn't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever first Corinthians chapter 7 kind of outlines the problems of being married to an unbeliever for a believer. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother have a wife that believe not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Now, this is telling you something very important. These people are yoked together. These people are yoked together in a relationship. Any brother is talking to Christians, talking about a brother in Christ. Any brother in Christ has a wife that believes not. That's an unequal yoking. And notice that there has to be a condition for this marriage to work. She be pleased to dwell with him. Let him not put her away. In other words, there's two parts to a marriage. Marriages are two different people. Because it says in verse 15, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother and sister is not under bondage in such cases. God has called us to peace. For what knowest you, O wife, whether you shall save your husband? Or how do you know, O man, whether you shall save your wife? In other words, a man and woman are two separate people. You're not the same spirit. You're not the same soul. The wife can be saved and the man not saved. They're two different people. The man can be saved and the woman not saved. Or the woman can be saved and the man not saved. How do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, O man, whether you shall save your wife? In other words, you don't know if your husband or wife is, is going to get saved if you're married to an unbeliever. And that's the main problem with being unequally yoked in a marriage, is that you don't know if you can save your husband or wife. They're not saved because of you. Some people misinterpret verse 14. It says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. 
else your children be unclean, but now they are holy. So this is talking about the children. The children are holy because of the husband or wife being saved. One of them is saved. The children, therefore, are holy. Because he says here, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Now, does that mean he's saved? No. We know that's not true. How do you know, O wife, whether you shall save your husband? Or how do you know, O man, whether you shall save your wife? So that's talking about children when it says sanctification there. That's not talking about sanctification as in salvation. He's not talking about the unbelieving husband saves the wife. No, that's not true. If that's true, then verse 16 is not true. Because it says, how do you know, O wife, whether you shall save your husband? Or how do you know, O man, whether you shall save your wife? In other words, if you're in an unequally yoked situation in a marriage, there's no way to know whether that other person is going to be saved or not. Paul just plainly tells you, you don't know. You do not know. And yet at the same time, if they be pleased to dwell together, if she be pleased to dwell with him, if the man is saved and the woman's not, if she's pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And if the woman has a husband that believes not, in other words, the woman's born again, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let him, let her not leave him. So you can see here that you can be unequally yoked in a marriage, and that's not going to take away your salvation. Otherwise, it wouldn't say in verse 16, how do you know, wife, whether you shall save your husband? In other words, you don't know if your husband will be saved, but you're still saved. Or how do you know, oh man, whether you shall save your wife? So a man and wife have separate relationships with God. Each man is stands before God alone. You don't stand before God with your wife or husband. You will not stand before God with someone else. You stand before God alone based on whether you believe in Jesus Christ or not. The message of salvation in John chapter 3 and verse 18 says, he that believes on him is not condemned but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, if a man is saved and he believes in Jesus Christ, is he condemned? No, he's not condemned. If he's married to a woman who is not a believer, is she condemned? Well, it says he that believes not is condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So you see how a marriage relationship doesn't save you. The unbeliever needs to get saved. How do you know, oh man, whether you will save your wife? How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? You don't. You're separate relationships. You who believe are not condemned. He that believes not is condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So that makes it crystal clear. Salvation is up to each individual person. You're born again or you're not. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So if you're saved and you're married to someone who's not saved, well, will that person see the kingdom of God? No, they're not born again. Except a person be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You have to be born again. So you see, a husband and wife are not the same spirit. They're not the same soul. But people have the choice whether to be yoked or unequally yoked. And Paul says right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And the reason for that is you have different objectives. What fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? There's different objectives. You don't have the kingdom of God in your mind if you're an unbeliever. That's not your, your objective is not the kingdom of God. A believer seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things are added unto him. So a believer should not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Now, when a person gets saved, sometimes their wife, they're already married and their wife isn't saved. If a woman gets saved, sometimes her husband, they were already married and he's not saved. And that, so that's going to happen. And so Paul addresses that because that is going to happen. And in some cases, people even knowingly marry someone who's not a believer. And that's going to cause them problems because there's going to be different goals and objectives in the relationship. That's why Paul says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Once again, that's not saying to be completely separate from all unbelievers. Our whole reason for being on this earth is to be ambassadors. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God reconciled the world to himself and he has made us ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech them through us that 
We pray you in Christ said, be reconciled to God. In other words, you're not reconciled to God. Well, who's saying this? A believer. A believer saying this to an unbeliever. So we are ambassadors to the world. Because once again, the simple gospel is John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world. The whole world, believers and unbelievers. He loves everyone. God loves us all. God wants everyone to be saved. God lo so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's once again Zoe, the life of God that you receive when you get born again. And that's what the righteousness of God is that comes to every believer. It's the Zoe, the life of God. That's how we get the righteousness of God because we are the righteousness of God in Christ when we're born again. And I've given separate messages about that. So the idea of being unequally yoked is not telling you to be separated from the world. It's not saying that. It says to be come out from them and be separate as far as being in a yoked relationship with them. In other words, don't touch the unclean things that being yoked with an unbeliever would cause you to touch. You don't want to be yoked together with an unbeliever. But your whole mission on this earth is to be an ambassador to the world. Now, the world's full of unbelievers. So we should be in contact with unbelievers, but we should not be yoked together with them. In other words, our missions are completely different. The mission of a believer is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Obviously, an unbeliever does not have that objective. So that's my message for today. Thanks for watching.